welcome everybody to the CHR and uh, the CHR's Humanities in Session series. It's part of the CHR's Advanced Research Seminar, which takes as its points of departure the question of the co-creation of concepts for our times. Concepts that help us to think about and from our entangled presence and future pasts across multiple scales of time, space, and complexity, as well as across differently situated inheritances of racial capitalism, colonial modernity, and apartheid. Our 2023 theme in the seminar series is on the after or afterness. And this is one such concept which the moderator of today's session, uh, Professor Moritz van Beerbedonka, will say more. And if I can just introduce the moderator, uh, Moritz is the senior researcher at the Center for Humanities Research. Um, he's the research manager and is convening the Humanities in Sessions series at the CHR. I'd like to welcome and thank the two leading scholars. We're still waiting for Humla Gogodo Madikizela to arrive, but just to welcome our incredible speakers, Patricia Parker from, from UNC Chapel Hill and, um, and Humla Gogodo Madikizela from University of Stellenbosch. Patricia, thank you for jumping on a plane, crossing the great Atlantic, and coming to be with us in person in South Africa for today's hybrid conversation on repair, on repair and its conjugates, the reparative and reparation. I'd also very briefly like to thank everyone who made today's session possible, um, including Michelle Smith, who's sitting at the back, Michelle, <laughs> um, Michaela Felix, and Lamiz Laukan, uh, as well as Oscar from University Audiovisual Services, and of course, Aaron Fahi, if I've said your name correctly, uh, I hope, Aaron, um, at the CHCI Consortium of Humanity Centers and Institutes at UC Berkeley. We're delighted that the co host of today's event is what is now called. Um, the CHCI's Critical Humanities Spaces Network, and has up till today been called the Humanities Administration Network, which is chaired by Professor Kathy Wallerstein at UC Davies. So I'm going to hand over to Kathy Wallerstein now to say a few words um, from the CHCI uh, and, and on behalf of the uh, Critical Humanities Humanities Spaces Network, and then Moritz will introduce um, Patricia Parker and Pumla Kobojo-Madikizela, and will chair the conversation. So thank you. I'm going to hand it over to you, Kathy. Thank you, Heidi. So I am Kathy Wallerstein, and I am chair of, um, as Heidi has already told you, what was until last week, the Humanities Administration Network of the Consortium of, of Humanities Centers and Institutes, or CHCI. <clears throat> and we have just changed our name um, to really better reflect the work that we've been doing um, to the Critical Humanities Spaces Network. Um, we are so proud to be co-sponsoring this event, which is in some ways on our side, the first in a series um, that we are organizing or co-organizing on the theme of repair. So let me say very briefly, for those of you who don't know, the CHCI is an, inter is an international organization that leverages the multiple perspectives of its membership to develop innovative models for collaborative research and bold strategies that strengthen the humanities across the globe. It currently has a membership of more than 300 organizations in the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Rim. And I will put a link in the chat um, to the CHCI so you can find out more. The CHCI has several sub-networks, of which ours is one. Um, so then in brief, the purpose of this group, of our group, is to provide a platform for critical reflection on the work of institutes 
centers, and other venues for humanities and cross-disciplinary work. Interrogating and theorizing the material, virtual, and philosophical spaces of the center, along with the aesthetic, affective, social, and political tasks that our centers um, assume and perform uh, and take on are some of the kinds of themes that this group addresses. Uh, if you're interested in getting on our mailing list, and please, please do get on our mailing list because we have events coming up, I will also put the link to our page uh, on the CHCI website in the chat, which will have a link to our mailing list. Um, and if you'd like to just find out more about the group, I will also put my own uh, email in the chat and you can ask me more detailed questions. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you guys for co-hosting. It's really, I'm excited about this event and without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Moritz. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for bearing with us as we try to figure out the logistics of a hybrid event in the midst of uh, load shedding in South Africa and um, the ripple effects of that on traffic, making our second presenter a little bit later than norm than expected. Um, I'm going to introduce... Um, are you guys? I'm, I'm fine. Um, I'm going to introduce the uh, the speakers today. So, the title of our session is "Repair in the After: A Conversation." So, it's the fourth the fourth installation of our Humanities in Session series at the CHR this year. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our two speakers, Prof. Patricia Parker and Prof. Kumla Gabordama Dikazela, who I will introduce in abstention, I guess, um, until she arrives. Um, and you can all report on, <laughs> on my introduction to when she gets it. Um, so our thematic focus in the CHR this year has been structured around thinking the after, a question that has structured our directed reading program and the framing of our Humanities in Session series. Put this a little schematically, we ask whether there is something like a method that could be said to be adequate to the post-apartheid or to the post-colonial. To the climate, the weather, in reference to Christina Sharp's In the Wake, in which we find ourselves. Disaster and possibility. From within the humanities, what does it mean to come after something like, like apartheid, like coloniality? After, in the manner of following along, pursuing, tracking, apprehending the morbid universe the network of complexes, as Fanon puts it, that colonialism left in its wake. Also then, perhaps, the state in which we currently find ourselves, a quality of time and a psychic state always already in a transferential relation with the past. One of, oh, so one of afterwardsness, where a memory trace of a scene, in Freud's terms, can always be activated, or in Fanon's language, detonated, too early or too late. Is there a method adequate to such a concept of after? In the session today, Patricia Parker and Pumla Gaboda Magikazela will enter into this conversation through the lens of repair. What does it mean, we ask in the prompt that frames this discussion, to abide by a concept like repair, especially when this comes to function as a term that always, that allows a different intervention in our time? What comes after repair? Is repair something that is only ever in the after, in the wake, or perhaps the whole? What does it mean to do repair? From what vantage point? And how might this be a method for coming to terms with the legacies of petition that scar our time? Repair in this instance would be a coming after, a pursuit, not an arrival. Patricia Parker is director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, the Rule W. Tyson Distinguished Professor of Humanities, um, yeah. and professor in the Department of Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and is also, together with me, a member of the CHCI Network Committee for Critical Humanities Spaces that is co-hosting this event. Patricia Parker works at the intersection of gender, race, and identity, in order to articulate a community-engaged intervention into questions of leadership and scholarship today, 
which she explores in her book on race, gender, and leadership. As she works out in her latest book on Ella Baker's catalytic leadership, Patricia's understanding of community engagement develops strategies of working with, not on. It is about staying with the trouble of working in the wake, in the whole. This is a project of possibility, of welcome, and critically of memory. In my reading, it's about creating spaces to speak that guard against repetitions with no difference. This orientation, Prof Parker brings into her role as the co-chair of UNC's Commission on History, Race, and a Way Forward. Prof Pumla Gabordo Madikazela is Professor and Research Chair for Historical Trauma and Transformation and the South African National Research Chair in Violent Histories and Transgenerational Trauma in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Stellenbosch University and the Director of the Center for the Study of the Afterlife of Violence and the Reparative Quest. In the 1990s in South Africa, Pumla was a commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee of South Africa and the Western Cape Chair of the Human Rights Violations Committee. In her research, Gobodo Madikizela sets to work on the legacies of violence and trauma as these continue to be lived in our world today. She has published many books on trauma repair and intergenerational traces. Her interest in intergenerational trauma and the problem of structural violence shapes her critical work into the concepts of trauma and reparative quest, in particular her reworking of the concept of empathy in psychoanalytic discourse. And through that lens, she recently contributed to a special issue of social dynamics on the mind of apartheid that is edited by my colleague Ross Truscott, who's sitting in the back, um, Derek Hook, and myself. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over to Patricia Parker. I think I'm just going to... Thank you, thank you, and good afternoon. Um, I want to um, recognize uh, Dean Kavakala, um, who was in the audience. Um, thank you, and also to thank um, Heidi uh, Grunebaum and Moritz uh, uh, von Weber, doctor, uh, uh, and the entire staff um, at the Center for Humanities Research for this wonderful invitation. Um, Moritz uh, sent me an email to say, would you like to get on the plane to come here instead of being on Zoom? And I said, yes, I would. Um, and so <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for your wonderful hospitality and that wonderful uh, welcome. It is my first time to South Africa. And indeed, it is my first time back on the continent. I say that in that way, because this trip uh, returns to traces of my being that were here before my ancestors were taken as captives. But this is not a conversation about before. It is about what happens in the after. I'm so honored to be on this panel, to be in conversation with the esteemed Dr. Pumla Gobodo Madizikala, um, who will be here shortly. We've spoken and, and um, we know that she will be here. Um, um, and we, when we talked about this conversation, um, we talked, we decided, we landed on this way of, of, of uh, forming our, our provocations, that, that both of our provocations are meant to point to critical questions about intergenerational trauma living in bodies and sustained institutionally. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible to have my image instead of Ms. Baker's. Is that what the choice is now or is it both? Not sure. Um, I think they can see you through there. Oh, through there, okay, all right. So we'll get to the that. big screen is- what I see, I, all right, okay, just one. No, no, it's okay. Well, you could if you want some. <laughs> So, so, so both of our provocations are meant to point to critical questions about intergenerational trauma, living in bodies and sustained institutionally, um, and how that relates to repair in the after. Um, 
And we are taking um, Christina Sharp as, as a sort of a, a jumping off point. We're using her concept of the wake as a provocation for thinking about repair. Um, Christina Sharp situates the wake as the conceptual frame of li for living blackness in the diaspora in the still unfolding aftermaths of Atlantic chattel slavery. She interrogates literary, visual, cinematic, and quotidian representations of black life that comprise what she calls the orthography of the wake, activating multiple registers of the wake, the path behind a ship, keeping watch with the dead, coming to consciousness. Sharp illustrates how black lives are swept up and animated in the afterlives of slavery and the deline and she delineates what survives. She delineates what survives despite such insistent violence and negation. So this is taken from, from her book and um, um, it's, it's quite remarkable the way that she, she and I believe you all had a reading group that, that went through. So we'll take that as a provocation for thinking about repair. And for me, those questions of repair are about excavating, naming, and dismantling the apparatuses, white supremacy, patriarchy, racial capitalism, that sustain traumatizing systems of power. Sometimes the machinations are hidden and sometimes they are not. But you cannot repair something that is not seen um, and named. The signs and symbols of, of these apparatuses, um, white supremacy, patriarchy, and racial capitalism are, are everywhere on the landscape, in our monuments, on our buildings, in museums, and also in the in intellectual traditions and methodologies. There are competing narratives that vie for political control um, and the dominant narratives are the ones that keep these traumatizing systems in place and intact. This is a, a major claim of my, my work, right? That these dominant narratives are circulating, complicit, sustaining them and, and sometimes even creating them, reproducing them. Um, recently, I heard an analysis by um, Jelani Cobb, who is the historian, journalist, and now dean of the Columbia School of Journalism in the U.S., um, and it, th that drives this point home around these dominant narratives being sustained. In 2020, he conceived of the Inequality Project, <clears throat> uh, pairing data science and a humanities form of journalism to highlight not only the current inequities in American society, but their roots and the ways in which these dynamics have been created and recreated over time. As we know, in 2020, the triple pandemics, the novel coronavirus pandemic, a pandemic-inspired recession, the egregious examples of widespread un of faith force by um, law enforcement were all converging and disproportionately impacting communities of color. In creating the in, in inequality project in response to those conditions, um, Cobb says he was especially struck by the question of how does how something like the novel coronavirus that is by definition novel, that is to say random, seeks, how can it seek out black and brown communities? This is happening in plain sight, but the apparatuses are complex and embedded in the everyday. So for me, the everyday, the common, um, is the entry point for the work of excavating, naming, and dismantling the apparatuses that sustain traumatizing systems of power. My project is to in engage with people living in communities where power is circulating, but also where historical memory of the tools of revolutionary resistance still resides. Okay, now slide one. I'll try. Okay. Um, 
Hey, Moritz and Pat. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We actually yes. don't see the screen share. You can see what the slide. <clears throat> On in Zoom, we cannot see the screen share. Oh, it's just starting now. Okay, great. Do. And you should be able to see it now. Uh huh. I'm do um, yes, we can see um, it. Big version. Okay. okay. We'll have faith it'll come back. Oh, what happened? Okay. All right. So. Picking up where I left off, um, that the um, this idea of engaging people who are living in communities where power is circulating, but also where the historical memory of the tools of revolutionary resistance still resides. My work draws on black radical traditions of uh, for democracy, especially exem as exemplified by Ella Baker, the 20th century human rights and civil rights activist whose career as a community organizer and organic intellectual spanned more than 50 years. Ella Baker left us with tools and lessons on how to catalyze the power of everyday democracy through community-based collaborations. Slide two. So in my recent book, which was published by the University of California Press, I write about how I have used Ella Baker's praxis in my work with communities uh, leading change. Her group-centered organizing philosophy focuses on creating and cultivating leaders from the grassroots up and not from the top down. As I detail in the book, her approach incorporates time-tested organizing tools for, communicating, for communication advocacy but these tools are not the means to an end. Rather, the focus is on critical, using critical pedagogies and participatory methodologies to meet people where they are and take into account how white supremacy, patriarchy, and extreme capitalism are operating in a particular context. Developing a critical consciousness about these conditions and the root causes of them is one of many responses, and perhaps often not the first or obvious one, but Ella Baker's focus is on developing the capacity to discern the seeds of critical consciousness in communities through listening to silences, creating free spaces for people to hear themselves think outside of the dominant gaze and to find their personal roots toward collective consciousness. I did not say finding their personal route toward consciousness because that can be something very different. But finding a route toward collective consciousness is one way that we can start to see this kind of development. And then to nurture and grow that into collective leadership for social justice and counter storytelling, healing and repair. In the US context, the roots of these systems and the possibilities for repair are in the wake of the afterlives of slavery, uh, to use Christina Sharp's phrasing, and in the dispossession of indigenous lands. Slide. So my most recent work applying Ella Baker's praxis has been as co-chair, um, along with Jim Lalutis uh, of the Commission of on History, Race, and a Way Forward, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And at this point, I do want to, to pause to acknowledge my colleagues at, at UNC Chapel Hill who are, um, who are watching on Zoom, um, the ones who are at the commission, but also at the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, um, our beautiful space at Hyde Hall. I hope wish that you could all come there uh, to be in our university room, which looks a little bit like this, I actually. <laughs> um, and um, um, so I just wanted to, to acknowledge uh, my colleagues there and how this work um, is supported by the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, as well as the Office of the Chancellor. And this commission 
um, includes faculty, staff, students, and representatives of local descendant communities um, whose enslaved ancestors helped build the early university. Um, and we understand that expertise um, that is needed on this commission should include the full range of knowledge um, that is necessary to fulfill our charge. Uh, this commission, you can go to the next one, was established in 2019, uh, but it was charged by the chancellor, um, Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz, who is um, our current chancellor, in the spring of 2020. And I wanted to put these words on the slides with his name above this charge to tell, you know, to signify the importance of this move um, to create this uh, commission. The charge of the commission is to research and teach UNC's history with relation to racial slavery and indigenous dispossession, and to make recommendations to the chancellor about ways that the university might best reckon with that history and create space for healing and repair. That was our charge. I, I will say um, that prior to accepting the chancellor's invitation to lead the commission, I wanted to make sure that it was indeed um, a commission that would not be our grandfather's commission. That is to say that it would be a, a, a it would be an instrument of real change. It would not be a showpiece with a black face um, in front of it. My my co chair is Jim Lewis, the historian, um, a white his, uh, man and a historian, um, and he gave me those assurances before I accepted um, to be the, the co-chair. And we're three years in, and I, he has kept his word that we have worked autonomously with him. It's, it's uh, complex, but uh, it, the work carries on. Um, so we can go. So I wanna say also that part of what I'm sharing, what I've, I'm sharing about this work that we're doing through the commission um, was presented at the 2023, this past spring, spring conference, uh, the University Studying Slavery. This is an international consortium uh, that holds a, a conference in the uh, spring and the fall. The fall uh, conference will be in Nova Scotia. So once you have time to plan, it's in September. Uh, but, but the spring was on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill. And um, um, we were able to bring um, hundreds of people on campus representing 55 universities and uh, four countries. Um, and we chose the theme at this place uh, to underscore that the work of studying the afterlives of slavery is highly contextual. Um, indeed, what I wanna do next is to tell you a bit about what that work looks like on our campus. It's a rather tortured and complex recent history, recent history. Forget about the, <laughs> the centuries before uh, that preceded the formation of the commission. Uh, this work began more than 20 years ago when the class of 2002 designated their class gift to creating a memorial to the unsung, the unsung founders. Um, this, uh, the, the inscription reads, the people of color enslaved and free who built the university. And that memorial was dedicated in 2005. Next slide. Then a decade later, in response to student demands, the Board of Trustees removed the name of William Saunders from a classroom building that had been named in the 1920s to honor him. Saunders was a chief organizer and leader of the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, during Reconstruction and a member of the Board of Trustees from 1874 to 1970, uh, 1991, 1891. His status as a Klan leader was noted in his appointment as a uh, board member, as an honorific. Soon after the removal um, of this name, so this, was, was, this happened in um, um, 2022, um, Sorry, um, not 22, 2019, I believe it was. Anyway, so I'll, I'll get the dates in just a moment. Um, soon after the removal, the University Task History Task Force, so there was a task force that was formed uh, that was appointed by then Chancellor Carol Fult. Um, and this was 
the, the, the new name was now um, Carolina Hall, and there was an, a permanent exhibit that was uh, in the basement to teach this history of the, the changing of the name. But the other thing that happened is that the task force was demand, disbanded and there was a moratorium by the Board of Trustees on name changing for 16 years. No more changing, no more changing. <laughs> um, and, um, and then right after that, this was in, um, in 2018 with the toppling um, of the Carolinas um, Confederate monument that happened in 2018. So. This is the history that preceded the formation of the commission. So when the Chancellor Gus Kruitz, uh commissioned us in 2020, um, we took up that work. And our first thing was to try to fight to get the moratorium removed and that's what we did. So next. So over those, um, over the last three years, what we've done after getting this moratorium lifted, we have worked in, on several areas of focus. And the main one is to, um, examine the cam a campus memorial landscape that is marked by buildings named for more than two dozen men who were enslavers, who went to war to defend the institution of racial slavery, and who played leadership roles in establishing the regime of Jim Crow. The murder of George Floyd and the global protests that followed pushed this work front and center during that summer of 2020. And I think we all remember the urgency of demands in the US context and all over the world for reckoning and repair at that time. I don't know how to... um, and so that summer we undertook research that informed the board of trustees decision to remove the names of four white supremacists uh, from campus building buildings. And that's um, Acock, Carr, Daniels and Ruffin Senior. It turns out that Ruffin Jr. was also there. So Ruffin name is still there. We made a case for Ruffin Jr. as well, but the Ruffin name is, is still there. And we also um, um, worked with the Board of Trustees to, for, to get a formal policy uh, on the removal of names. So again, this work of excavation, this, this seems real to me in the moment, right? I mean, at least, you know, we're working there and building uh, capacity. Um, the next slide, please. I should say that two of those buildings have been renamed. Uh, one in honor of uh, Ms. Hortense McClinton. She was the first black tenure line member of the faculty. She's still living. She's 104, I think. She may be 105. She came to the dedication of the building and um, you had to try to keep up with her with, in terms of her energy. Um, she was appointed as a professor in the School of Social Work in uh, 1966. And then the second is named for Mr. Henry Owl, who is the first Native American and first person of color admitted to UNC. And he received uh, an MA degree in history in 1929. Next slide. So since then, we have recommended the removal of uh, an additional 10 names, including Bingham Hall, which is the name of the building that houses the Department of Communication on my campus where I am a professor um, and for five years I was chair of the department. Um, Robert Hall Bingham was a white supremacist who promoted racial Anglo-Saxonism, which is a blood and soil strain of white supremacist ideology. Um, he also educated generations of white men to celebrate racist violence as a civilizing force and an instrument of order, social, economic, and political, but uh, at home, both at home and on a global scale. So a lot of influence on white supremacy. Um, he also had a, a, a very big influence on elevating the University of North Carolina from a regional sort of uh, fledgling university to its promise with getting philanthropists to, um, to support the, the, the university. And he was a white supremacist who perpetuated that and wanted that to be at the foundation of the university. I will tell you that one of the most impactful conversations I've had in recent years happened in 2020 when Emily Bingham, a historian and a great granddaughter of Robert, called me to tell me about the work she's doing to advocate for the removal of the Bingham name from my building. 
I believe Emily is, is watching. I think I saw the name of, uh, I saw her daughter, um, one of her children on, online as well. I'll, I'll let her know that I would be sharing this. Um, um, in researching her book uh, on Robert Bingham's grand, granddaughter, a book called Irrepressible, The Jazz Age Life of Henrietta Bingham, which was sort of, but in that research, she discovered that Robert Bingham was a member of the Klan. Um, and, there's, and that's in family history. And so she's documented that history in a new book about the racist anthem, My Old Kentucky Home. It was quite a powerful moment, the granddaughter of ancestors who were enslaved, sitting in the corner office, <clears throat> prosperous, chair of the department in a building name for someone whose ideologies and practices were forms of annihilation for my people. And hearing his great granddaughter tell me what she is doing to dismantle white supremacy, that she is joining forces with me in my work on the commission. So we're still awaiting action by the Board of Trustees regarding the removal of, of the Bingham and, uh, name and other names um, on the landscape. And finally, this brings me to the commission's work with descendant communities, uh, which really underscores all of the work that we're doing uh, to identify and find appropriate means of memorializing the enslaved men and women who built and sustained the antebellum university and whose descendants are part of the life of the university today. Enslaved and indigenous people figure prominently in the making of US universities, but their histories are erased from the landscape and colonized in the archives. Descendant communities hold those histories through stories, archives, and other ways of knowing passed down through generations but often they do not trust the university to reclaim and memorialize and tell their stories. Um, and, and they, you know, and other institutions that shape historical memory. And so part of our work has been on the commission, uh, including descent, members of the descendant um, um, community on the commission, part of that work has been to has been centered on extracting information from archival records that um, mostly buried stories of the people whose labor the university purchased from their enslavers. Um, there's um, evidence of, of the, you know, the early university benefiting from the sale of, of enslaved people that they acquired through its cheats and that is um, property of individuals who died without wills or discoverable heirs. And the university had a um, network of lawyers, one on every county seat, who on court day would identify a sheeted property that the university could claim. Um, and that property often included enslaved people. So the university took possession and profited from the sale of them. So the early university was financed through that, through through uh, philanthropy and um, through, you know, through, through the sale of the sheets, uh, through the sheets. Um, so again, the members of descendant communities have, have guided our, our part work and I'll end with, with uh, just two examples here. Um, one is focused on uh, Barbie Cemetery, which is located adjacent to the, uh, a, a large business center um, just off campus. It's an education facility. Um, and so the center, the, 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 the cemetery and the education facility both sit on land that once belonged to the Barbie family, some of the wealthiest enslavers in Orange County, and one of the early university's most important benefactors. Uh, we've we've um, hired, um, uh, an we've done an archeological survey and recent ground penetrating radar that indicate that as many as 100 enslaved men, women, and children are buried there in unmarked graves. And members of the local descendant community, leaders, um, as well as at the, the, the business school, the Kenan Flagler Business School, and university employees who work at this center um, have for many years expressed concerns that this current curation, as you can see, there's a sign that reads that um, this um, cemetery contains about 120 graves on 
um, a hilltop known as Barbie Mountain. And it goes on to talk about the white uh, uh, um, en enslavers who are buried there, but make no mention of the enslaved people um, who's, who died and, and were buried there. So we've been working um, in partnership with descendants um, in focusing um, on researching the history of the people buried there. And this has been some of the most uh, rewarding and deep work that we're doing. It, it has the seeds of, of further um, transformation and revolution, I think. And then the, the last thing I'll talk about again is this, um, this unfinished work of the Unsung Founders Memorial. So again, this was a visionary, uh, on the one hand, this monument was the visionary bravery of those students who were ahead of their time in 2002 in the U.S. context. Nobody was talking about slavery and honoring, honoring the unsung founders. And so through the commission's work, we've re-engaged the students who were at the forefront. They're now in their 40s, uh, living their lives. And, and they've, we, we've talked with them and, and heard their stories about what that activism took to convince their fellow students that this should be the class gift. Usually the gift is something else. This was something that, that took some political work on their, their, their part. But they did not engage with descendant communities. Um, and so for various reasons, this is, this is a, a point of contention for uh, the, the, the black community, the local um, um, descendants. So there's some unfinished uh, work here. And this is the problem. This is one of the, the trouble with this. It's with the design. Um, it, it's a marble uh, table top surrounded by four stools, uh, which invites visitors to decorate the space by eating their lunch and changing babies atop the sculpture. Um, and so members of the Black descendant community have expressed concerns about the fact that they were not included in the conversation and, you know, thinking about appropriate ways to memorialize their forebearers. Um, and many have also taken offense at the diminutive stature of the bronze figures that hold up the tabletop. Um, and so we're engaged in a series of conversations to, 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 to use this as an entry point for looking at the larger question of how should the university, this was student activism. This is, we're yet to hear how the university, we are saying, here's how we acknowledge the um, unsung founders of the university, uh, and also including those students in those conversations. Um, next slide. I will say that we're also working with descendant communities uh, on a land acknowledgement, uh, recognizing that the story of racial slavery in, is inextricably tied to the story of indigenous peoples who, you know, who occupied the long land long before the founding of the university. And so our goal has been to recover those stories through archive and lift up their humanity and resistance, while also acknowledging that their dispossession is central to the history of the And so we're guided by indigenous members of the indigenous community, student uh, groups, uh, there's a uh, First Nations uh, graduate circle that's been very um, um, forward thinking and, and helping in, in sort of working with us. Um, and just uh, affirming the university's uh, commitment to partnering and the commission's commitment to um, partnering with them in shaping self-determined um, futures, including we've had new investments in faculty lines in the teaching of American Indian history and culture. Um, and so we know that there's so much work to, to do. Um, and finally, let me just say that um, we are working to um, to teach a fuller history uh, of the university across and with communities. And so one of our, one thing that we've, we've uh, started and I'll end with this is that our colleagues and fellow commissioners um, who are community leaders and descendants. So uh, Danita Mason Hogan's uh, and Dolores Bailey are both leaders of the commission uh, working. So Danita is working with Simona Golden um, on this um, notion of equity in schools. I mean, the, the Chapel Hill has the largest achievement gap in the country in terms of between black and white um, achievement. Um, and which is usually the case in very prosperous, um, uh, predominantly white uh, cities. Um, so this book club, um, we've, we've um, I think the, the actual, the, the last uh, series is tonight, we've had three. 
um, and the, the authors of the book, Sandy Darity and Kristen Mullen, were discussing the book. And it's called From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. And this has been a really uh, provocative uh, series of conversations, people from all walks of the community. You know, it's interesting to, to, to create that kind of space and to see who, who shows up. And, and I think we've tapped into people want to have these conversations about repair, Black, white, Indigenous um, from all over. And so I'm very proud that we're, um, uh, our commission uh, members are, are doing that work. Um, so what all of this speaks to is this imperative to change the narrative, to tell a full, honest, and complete story of the university's past and present, to recognize that histories stretch across centuries and are, that these histories are filled with trauma and pain. And so we want to stay aware that our work taps into those unreconciled injuries uh, that neither our university nor our nation has reconciled or addressed. Yes, please. <laughs> We're having some technological problems. Okay. Um, it's possible to move it from just behind you. Would it be in any if I can say that it's behind the camera? Yeah, yeah. You can. Is it possible? Channels are shared. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that it's facing the people. Hey. Is it you? I don't know where. Is this way is the it? question is that yeah. where is first? As long as they can hear you, is the point. At the moment, we're using the sound from the laptop. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But if we if we move this way, let's do a quick shot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so. Thank you. Yeah, it's still streaming. Thank you, everybody online, for bearing with us as we just shuffle. Our um, our second speaker. What is this? This is the M. Okay, we didn't want to show you. Oh, okay. Is it showing now? Well, this is my camera. Okay, can you just switch to I think we should just carry on. Can everybody hear Pumla speaking? Can uh, sounds uh, test one, two, three? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can hear it online. Okay. But you're not on screen, which is the um, problem. Do that. But you can hear it. There you go. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to come and see your space. Thank you, Heidi, for inviting me, your colleagues in the audience. Um, I've seen people from Africa uh, at some point. They are here, some of them. And it's wonderful to meet you, Pat. Thank you, and Maurice, for all the hard work that you've been doing, and others um, um, who are part of the committee. Really, I'm very grateful to be here to have this conversation. Heidi and I come a long way, more than 20 years now. I think actually it's been close to 30, if I'm not uh, exaggerating. It dates us a bit, but that's what it is. Um, by way of connecting to Pat's presentation, I want to start by um, just sharing with you a conversation we had yesterday 
at our center. One of our um, the, the colleagues was presenting a paper on, um, her name is uh, Anel Stacy Davis, which is here at UWC. She was presenting a paper on the institutional culture, I'll summarize it there, is, is the institutional culture, and really giving a genealogy of this institutional culture, which is to say a genealogy of racism in the institution, uh, really. And what was really so uh, powerful about the presentation is just getting us to participate in her thinking about how all this began. And what inspired her was the infamous article that was written um, on uh, that argument that uh, colored women from marginalized, historically marginalized communities have a low uh, uh, capacity for cognitive intellectual, intellectual understanding. That inspired the article and she asked the question, why is it that black bodies are put on the spot in this way? And that research was really in a way um, research that speaks to, to the landscape, to the land, to the culture, but also to the structures, to the edifices, both the structures as in uh, cultural structures, but also the edifices, all these buildings and so on, and how they are um, implicated in the way you remember the past. I start with this because I want to bring you closer to what I'm talking about. The title of my talk is um, Screamed into the Future, a Reparative Quest. And my talk is organized around memory of the body, how the body remembers. And all these experiences institutionally, the cultural, the cultures that are um, intransigent in these institutions, they are cultures that actually are embodied. They are experiencing the body. When Anel uh, states Darius, uh, Dr. Darius spoke about this institutional, um, how, how this history is entrenched in history of separation of othering, how it is entrenched. It's also a history of how both white bodies and black bodies carry the memory of the history. And my talk today is on uh, how black bodies remember. And as some of you may know, I served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I was responsible for coordinating the public hearings of the TRC. And so spent uh, uh, the entire time with the TRC uh, working with people who, were, who had experienced uh, violence on their bodies uh, or on the bodies or, or of, their, of their loved ones. And so the question for me is that moment of the TRC, which is now about 30 years ago, that moment of the TRC was the moment when we were imagining the kind of future that we want in South Africa. We are at that future. We are now actually in, in that future, in the future moment that was imagined then. And the question is, what, where are we, where do we stand in relation to what was imagined? Then, and I argue in this paper that there's something about memory that cannot be uh, wheeled away by, by interventions such as reconciliation or you know, work on, on forgiveness. Uh, I know I worked a lot on forgiveness. However, 30 years later, I realized that there are fundamental questions that we have to address. And one of these concerns the fact that people carry, people testified at the TRC, but we imagined that by testifying, it will wipe out all that history and people can move on. But we now realize that is carried into people, in people's bodies and passed on in that way. And so in this paper, uh, I present really some sign, what I call signposts, uh, just to give a sense of what I'm talking about and I refer to the reparative quest. The first part of the paper is a critical reflection on the aesthetics of memory through the lens of the TRC. I then turn 
the spotlights from the affective moments of the TRC to the everyday ordinariness of South African life and engage a critical reflection on the relevance of transgenerational transmission of memory as an explanatory framework for understanding the continuing impacts of the past. In the final section of the paper, I consider the question of repair and why the optimism of quote unquote national reconciliation, which framed the work of the TRC with its language of finality, of something being complete, reconciliation, we shall be reconciled, no longer rings through true. By making this remark that this notion of reconciliation no longer rings true, my aim is not to suggest that we have no way out of the destructiveness of the violence of the past, that a path towards repair is impossible. The position I hold is against views that suggest that being black in the world, that the life of the historically oppressed is doomed to hopelessness, and that our societies are damaged beyond repair. Far from it. Uh, this you, these kinds of views are views that are held by people like Fred Moulton, for instance, who believes, quote, there is no healing. There is rather a perpetual cutting, a constancy of expansive and enfolding rapture and wound, unquote. Now, these views are very uh, seductive, uh, but I I do not believe that we are beyond repair in the way that these scholars have, um, have portrayed the, uh, the circumstances of Black life as a perpetual wound. The idea of the reparative quest is closely aligned with my idea, our idea uh, in our center of the reparative quest is closely aligned with David Bell's quest to address the problem of racism. As the scholar who gave us the language and the practice of critical race theory, he urges us in our efforts to engage in transformative action to restore justice, to quote, give reflective force to the tendency to see ourselves as merely determined by forces larger than ourselves and to which we are bound to surrender our capacity to act in freedom. This actually happens also Hannah Arendt's notion of, you know, we are beings, the human life is, is life that is a life of action, even in terms of the quest for freedom. In other words, according to Derek Bell and according to me, our critical political sensibilities should be uh, should temper this idea of the of the difficulty of our situation, the complexity of our situation, with the sense that it is not impossible, that there are possibilities for repair. I'm going to start, and, and, and this is a way of just sharing with you the idea of the embeddedness of these memories in the body uh, transgenerationally. So I share two quotes uh, from two award-winning uh, writers. The first is, uh, with, who are based in Zimbabwe and the United States respectively. The first is from Titi Damaremba, who writes in the morning, uh, this morning report quotes, she speaks here about the younger generation and in reference to the older generation who fought in the war, the women especially. So she, referring to one of the younger generation, a miss, she does not know, quote, she does not know the horrors each person lived through, the kind of violence that not even my aunts have succeeded in running from, that leaps from their bowels onto their tongues again, and again, in other words, this embeddedness of violence inside the body, that the body carries these memories uh, into their bowels and into their tongue. In other words, it defines who they are because they had lived through the violence. The second quote is from Tony Morrison's beloved, 
And she says, again, speaking about the idea, trying to paint a picture of what it means for these repetitions of the past to recur over and over again. And quotes, someday you will be walking down the road and you hear something or see something going on so clear and you think it's you thinking it up. But no, it's when you bump into a dream memory that belongs to somebody else. The picture is still there. And what's more, if you go there, you who never was there, if you go there and stand in the place where it was, it would happen again. Because even though it's all over, over and done with, it's going to always be there waiting for you. So she paints this image of something repeating. And I like the power of literature in this way that you can paint these pictures that make people understand what you're talking about. How does the current inequality, the current violence in South Africa, not just the violence of racism, but also of the everyday acts of marginalization reflect on that moment of South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy? How might the affective moments of the TRC public testimonies and the TRC as a memorial space of bearing witness to collective uh, pay speak to the current social and political moment in South Africa with uh, the vision of reconciliation. I want to begin then with a discussion of the opening moments and perhaps you could at this point uh, put the first slide. Um, the opening moments of the TRC public hearing. Um, uh, in, in, in Titi Damalenda's uh, quote, the one that I just read, where we, we suggest that although the women in her book may have escaped and left the violence of past wars behind, the violence resists banishment to the past. It has left an indelible print and is felt at the most intimate level in their bodies and expressed through the narratives that draw them effectively into community with one another. And this was the power of the TRC, the sharing of narratives and bringing people together through these stories. Um, one such, actually, uh, can, you, can you move up, please, to the first one? Um, this one. Oh, is that the first, can, can you, oh, sorry. Or is it another, um, that came in separate? Okay, don't worry, it, it's not there. Anyway, what, what I wanted, what I thought I had the slides on, on the, when we started with the TRC, we, we did what I designed a program that we called at the time the outreach program. And the intention was to inform people about the work of the TRC, to inform communities about the work of the TRC. And that the first meeting that we had was in the village. The room was packed. It was packed to capacity. It was standing room only. We were at this event just to inform people, this is what's going to happen, and this is, this is the procedure of collecting stories. Every person in the room started telling their stories. Archbishop Tutu was sitting in front, I was, I was there. Everyone in the room got up to tell their story of what happened to them. There was this uncontrollable, slow surge of telling stories of how they suffered, what pain they experienced, the people, the loved, one, loved ones that had been killed, the loved ones' bodies which had not been found, the graves that were not really their graves. There was just a lot. This was before the TRC started this year, and already there was this outpouring of testimony at an event that was not intended to be uh, a public hearing. All of these people wanted to know why, who did it? Who are the people who did it? Where are they now? When the TRC hearings opened, you can see the, it was a moment of, it seemed like a moment of hope. And as you can see in the uh, image there, it, it seems to hold at once the tension between the symbols of pain and of suffering and the promise of renewal in the way that that setting appears on the screen there. And, and when the audience started to open at the opening of the TRC, you could feel the, the sense of hope. People 
people started singing the songs that are sung at, at rallies, at political rallies, at funerals, all the songs that people, everybody knew. It was like a, a national choir standing up to sing Lisa and City Malako. Everyone in this. And scholars who are uh, critics of uh, the theological uh, uh, and critics of us to, to, to specifically, they were very critical of this of these songs because they said, oh, the TRC is becoming a religious thing and so on and so forth. But what they miss is that these moments were not really about the religious or the theological or, or in any way. They were certainly about the spiritual but they were also about the cultural. They were about how people through song and music are held together by these songs. In fact, during the TRC, during these hearings, as we saw to do himself, at some point broke into a song, the next one, please. And during a moment when a, a witness was screaming her pain and started the song. There was silence, there was a scream, and I, I'm gonna circle back to the scream. And then there was a moment when of silence in the midst of her scream, and all you could hear was Asif Sobtu to starting the song. Senzenina, 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 senzenina. The whole you can imagine in this fashion, the entire hall singing, following us to show to you. So the singing at that moment and the audience spontaneously in the way that you so beautifully did yourself is a reminder of the strong intergenerational connection between Tutu singing of the song was itself a demonstration of the lineage of struggle. It symbolized an abiding framework not only of a shared memory of the past, but also the telescoping of this past, back to the past and across generations into the future, which was the now. It symbolized a presencing of the future now of testimony presenting us with the possibility of looking at trauma, not as a repetition of the past, but its continuity. These narratives are clearly not individual narratives, individual narratives, but ones that held the community. They spoke to the feelings of everybody. The songs became a vehicle for opening the space for historical reflection and, 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 and translation of these shared emotive moments into important sources of history. Remember again, the singing is embodied. It's a singing that is embodied. I mean, the fact that you are responding to this to the song yourselves, there's something about the songs that is embodied. It touches on a memory that triggers this response of core operative singing. My point goes more to the observation posited by W.E.B. Du Bois, who calls the heart-touching witness of African-American spiritual songs, the solo songs, and concludes that the solo songs carry a vision of hope, yet the songs are not without the shadow of fear hanging over them. They are the music of people who quote, tell of death and suffering and unvoiced longing toward a truer world of misty wanderings and hidden ways, unquote. Solo song extends my own thinking about trauma in this project, about its expression at a collective level, what and how we presume is repeated or transmitted and translated, and how traumatic memory becomes translated into different <clears throat> Languages of narrative through the arts, through expressions, to the performative testifying itself, because the testifying was itself became a kind of a performative act. And so this brings me to one moment of this performative act that has significance in the way that I am working with the notion of transgenerational trauma, the screen of Lomondo Kalata, which has become an iconic moment 
at the opening of the T TRC. It evoked the song that I shared with you now when Tutu uh, broke out into song. She cried out as if the scream buried deep inside her was now bursting out with a force that shattered the silence in the hall. The fascinating thing when, you, when one reflects on that moment is that the opening of the TRC was held in the, in the East London City Hall. This hall was covered inside with plaques, memorial plaques of the British soldiers who fought in South Africa. They fought with the Afrikaners during the wars uh, of fighting for the country that didn't really belong to them. <laughs> and, and so there were plaques around as the hearing was happening. So what in my mind at that moment, I felt, wow, it's like, like screaming at all of this. It's like screaming at this edifice of imperial, you know, history that where the hearing was held. In fact, the, the building itself had an image, a symbol of a celebration of Queen Victoria's Jubilee. At the top, there was some structure that was inserted on the top of the building to celebrate Queen Victoria. Now, here is the moment of truth and no more the Talata screaming her pain into this shattering, shattering the hall. I read this as, as a prophetic moment an interruption of the vision of reconciliation right at the start of the TRC process, a moment that seems to foretell the tragedy that must continue. Not only is the past not past, it is a future that looms on the horizon. As an interruption, her cry announces its presence in this history and reclaims its place in it. In another work um, that I'm going to be presenting at my home institution, I elaborate on the significance of this screen as a symbol uh, that draws us closer to understanding that these paths are not just the temporality of this memory, it's not just a linear connection from the past of the recent history to the now, it goes back across generation into the colonial periods. This, this is how the bodies, because Nomonde represents really the, the, the matriarchs who have carried pain in their bodies. And so the screaming is also a hearkening uh, back to that history that was never acknowledged. There are several <coughs> scholars who speak about this um, in terms of context. Um, Psychometric scholars, especially, will speak about it in terms of these ghost like hauntings that are returning to haunt us. And some other uh, scholars uh, 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 speak about memories that it, it, experiences that were never resolved. And because they were never resolved, they remain a task that is unfinished, that is passed on for the next generation to complete. In other words, our forebears never had an opportunity to work through this past. And so they are buried deep into their psyches. And because they are unfinished, there are stories that have not completely been unraveled. They are passed on unconsciously. This is partly true, but I think reliance on this notion of this past as being haunting, glosses over the truth that we are experiencing concrete oppression in the now, in the moment. People are facing the, the violence in the now. If you think about the contemporary, we are thinking about a new kind of perpetrators, perpetrators that are embezzling the resources of the country, repeating the acts of the, of the colonial masters because what is happening today, the embezzlement of my may not be in the form of violation to the body directly, but it is very much about violation to the body and the perpetrators of the atrocity of embezzlement of funding 
funds and corruption have a direct impact on the lives of the marginalized oppressed who have been oppressed under colonial colonial history, apartheid history, their descendants continue to inherit their past. And so the, the, the ends of these new perpetrators are impacting on the lives of people and hence there is no way that we cannot consider them to be uh, perpetrators. I'm going to skip because I do want us to have a conversation, but I want to, to show, um, uh, I'm going to play to, to, to now come to the point of, of talking about why the notion of the reparative quest instead of repair. This idea really revolves around uh, the reality of the crime which in fact, I just want to show one clip, please, if you may. Um, I think it's number seven or so. Can you go down? Uh, it says Benzin, something Benzin. Because this shows us what the nature, what the crime is. What is it that, what is it that we are supposed to repair from? What is it that we are supposed to heal from? And so if you look at this image of Jeffrey Benzin, um, uh, it's hidden, uh, that's great. So he is demonstrating, I and mean, this was one of the lowest moments uh, uh, of the team, not lowest for the TRC, but for these perpetrators. He is asked by the men who he tortured to demonstrate. He asked him, how did you torture me? How did you drive me so close to the point of my death? And, and yet you call yourself a, a, a husband you know, a responsible citizen. How can you be all of these things and commit these kinds of crimes? And so by showing this image, it's important for us to remember that these are the crimes. This is what people are carrying in their bodies, the families, the, the people who were direct victims, and for the men to actually demo, have to demonstrate the crime that he committed himself in that way is a reminder to his accomplice, to people he worked with, to people who benefited from these acts, that this has to be remembered. It's not just the memory of people with victims. It's a memory that becomes necessary in order for us to talk about the possibility of the process of repair. Acknowledgement and accountability is important. How do we do that? By putting up this kind of image and holding a mirror up to the people who did it and those who benefited from it. So that by so doing, we might be able to have a conversation around the issue of, account of accountability, which is very much missing in our society. This is why um, I believe that the arts have never been more important than they are today. To offer a language for us, to open up these conversations. Uh, they are complex, we accept, but the complexity doesn't mean that we have to hide away from them or push them out of the carpet. The arts has never been more important. The question is not whether public conversations about the arts are important, but rather how we can forge private public partnerships and use artists' works as building blocks for a politics of care that may open the possibility of social solidarity. The importance will often ask, what is it about the arts that makes it so important in this conversation? I think that one of the one of the points that we that um, we have to highlight in this work on the importance of the arts is how the arts actually <laughs> engages our emotional and our intellectual at the same time. That by engaging the emotional and the you know, and, and the and, and, and the intellectual, the arts draw the arts draws us into the subject matter that is being discussed, so that those who were who were turned their face away from the crimes can face them in a way that is invitational. This too is very important. That to strategically use the arts in this way to invite engagement so that people can face what they did through the language of the arts and begin to speak through the language of their bodies 
and connect with other bodies. This is what is important with the R. To conclude, I want to illustrate the arts possibilities with just two examples. One, the second one will be online, but the first one I'm going to describe to you. Tending Jali, some of you know the arts, the performance art enthusiasts, I see Peggy smiling. She, she is, um, uh, she, 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 she tells the story in, in her performance. This is one of the ideas of the importance of the arts. At the opening of this play, Women in Waiting, which is about the experiences of her mother, her own as a domestic worker, how her mother would leave them at home as babies and go and work in white people's homes, only coming back home once a year during Christmas. How she, you know, the children had to live through all those months without a mother because their mother was mother to someone else. And then she comes to her own story as a domestic worker who had to live behind her own children repeating exactly what her mother had to do. She is doing it as well. And then she becomes a performer to tell the story. Now, in at the Bedstar, I uh, am a member of the, the, the patrons of the Bedstar. And so these plays, I actually will show you this kind of place, how audiences are responding to them. The audience, people started streaming out, but white people, people said they did not move. The play was over, we were going out to the opening, we were going out to um, have drinks, while people sat, and some of them were weeping and, 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 and emotional, and some were comforting one another. And you ask yourself, what are they crying about? Now, we won't go into that now. And, and, and I, but no, but look, I don't, I don't belong to the school that says it's white tears. I, I don't belong, I belong to the school that says there's something there. Let's talk about it. What is it? The problem is that we never have chance, a chance to actually talk about it. It's not just white people's tears. Okay, it's white people crying, what you're saying. But it's not in that dismissive kind of way. It's, it, it, it becomes dismissible when nothing happens after that. But the point is, something is touched, something moves. The next important thing is, what are the conversations that we create as a result of the responses to these kinds of acts? And, and, and so, in another performance, again, she's such a powerful, performer with her voice. She was performing in, 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 in Philip Miller's Rewind cantata, and she sings, and, and, and forgive me for referencing my book, she, she sings a text from my book, A Human Being Died That Night, a story of a mother whose 11-year-old son is shot as he is running back to school, to class, holding a slice of bread, which he just took from home, going to class, and his shots and the mother hears, Temba, Mama ka temba, Bantu Muni temba. She runs out to find a dead son's body. The way the temple performs that moment is so unbelievably moving for everybody. She performs it with such tangible force that it leaves people actually feeling the moment of the mother discovering the body of a dead child. And the point of the arts is that you bring us there through the arts. We are there with the mother at that moment as she grieves and she warns. There's something about the story that touches our deepest core. Because after all, we are a connected species. No man is an island, no person is an island. We are through relationships, we are a relational people, species. And so when these stories are told, we are moved in this way. And so the arts does that. It takes us to that point, takes us to that moment. The challenge is how do we hold one another at that moment and then develop these zones of solidarity 
so that from those zones of solidarity, we can speak the language of social justice together, not the language of they and them and the other, but we speak the language of social justice together. Those moments are very critical. The last, and I, and I really mean the last, <laughs> is uh, I, I would like to ask you, please, it's a very short paper, not quite a minute, um, and it's a, um, uh, I'll just give a little bit of a, a short background. Uh, it, it's from the wine, Philip Miller's wine. He takes the scream of Norman de Talata, the actual scream, the recorded scream of Norman de Talata, and he transforms it into music. And he gets the most famous soprano in mezzo soprano in South Africa, Smogile, God bless her soul, to sing the scream of Norman de Talata. And again, it's a moment, it's a sacred moment. It's a, it's a moment that invites us to the place of sacredness, where we connect our bodies to the body of this woman who is not visible at the time, but is only visible through the song that you are about to hear. So I leave it to faith. Thank you. I hope it works. <laughs> The child. Yeah. That's not good. From Monday Talata. No Monday Talata. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So thank you so much for that to your, your incredible contributions. Um do I need to speak louder so everybody can hear me? <laughs> Can't I just talk to Pat and <laughs> <laughs> Um, So we're gonna we're gonna open this this conversation to the audience, the audience that's here in the room, as well as the audience that's online. There have been a few a few questions that have been um, uh, posted posted online. So. Um, but I want to first, uh, there is so much, there is, <laughs> there is so, so many interesting connections between your two talks as well around um, 
I'm thinking particularly around embodiment and the, the performative as a way to, to deal, deal with that trauma that lingers in the body. Um, and I'm going to reserve my privilege of asking questions to later and open it to the to the room. So if there are questions here, if you can raise your hands. Yeah, we, if we can just, sorry, so we're still technologically deficient. Um, Moritz, I just wanted to let you know that there are questions both in the Q&A and in the chat. Okay. Um, Around with the mic. Yeah, you could run around with the mic. That's what I. Kathy, <laughs> if you would let us know if um, if questions aren't being able to heard, be heard online so that we can then repeat them. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Joy Joseph from ABEC. Thank you to our beautiful professors for such an interesting <laughs> conversation. Um, I'm much of a practical scholar because I believe in impacting lives beyond scholarship. My first question goes to the first speaker who says, excuse me, history stress across centuries and are filled with traumas and pains. Please, could you expatiate a little bit? You talked about performance, I did not really understand. How, how do we help, especially women, to, to get out of this, some of these traumatic conditions? Because it's existing, even in scholarship. It's not by accident that I'm in Africa, because I've always told God I want to be a woman who can impact life beyond being a doctor. My doctor is not just for me. You're a doctor so far. Many lives are really impacted. So my question is, expect the performance, what you need, and how best, not how best, but the practical steps because, that you can do with victims, especially women who come with certain traumatic conditions because they are in existence. That's my first question. Then to our dear Professor Puma, she raised the issue of social solidarity. I'm a bit scared because if you open up your challenges in, in certain contexts, you may get stigmatized. And as women, we are trained to internalize our oppressions until it gets to a state where you say, oh, no, I'm not going to take this anymore. At that point, the woman is already fainting. So, from how do we, in our little ability to achieve social solidarity without stigmatization. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we should take a round, we should take a round of questions and then so just, just, so just to say that that, that was audible, it, there are reverberations, but it, I think it's, you know, clear enough. But if people can speak as clearly as possible, that would help. Okay. I didn't see where the mic was. Yeah. Um, Professor Palmer, uh, I would like to ask a question, particularly about the historiography of rapture and continuity. Because at the beginning of your talk, you opened up uh, the question of COVID and uh, how it attacked uh, black and brown communities unequally. And that moment for me raised an important question because generally scholars have raised the uh, market shift. They decide on material racism in terms of for more culturally coded, sophisticated human racism. Um, but actually, the problem is that it's really like wild open. And one of the problems is if there if, if hasn't actually been that shift, if this order of the religion a continuity, and it's almost a genocide of continuity, um, to the extent that you could ask at a certain point to you. Uh, most of the population on planet Earth was considered disposable, um, and the vaccines were kept in the hands of a certain group of people. Um, so, one of the questions I'm wondering is at what moment does a moment of rupture form, or an ethical moment? We've kind of been through slavery, apartheid, and 
we're probably going to enter into an Anthropocene slash virus um, and we're going to end up fighting for resources and etc. And I'm wondering where this moment actually goes. We take, let's take one more question from the audience here and then I'll, I'll read a question from online as well. Then. Okay. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, I think this is very exciting. This is very carefully as, as you present your, your talks. And what is more exciting for me is the interconnectedness you know, between what you are sharing with us Although, you know, if you look at what Prof. Barker is, is, is uh, positioned and what Prof. Gordon put in his position, the one question I have, I know it's, it's not an easy one, uh, Prof. Gordon, you, you made a point about the now and uh, you know, the abuse of state resources and uh, possible the extent to which that could um, impact, well, indirectly uh, on the part of those who are on the receiving hand. And I think if you can elaborate on that a bit, because I see something which I would want you to bring to the fore, um, which is sort of relating to, to your work. I don't want to say more, but I'm sure you have a thousand words to share with us. You did touch on it. As I was you. What do you see? What is it that you see? Why don't you spell out so that you can <laughs> have the full range of your intervention? Well, it's some parallels, um, in a way. Um, I mean, as you were giving us this whole um, uh, traumatic situation, Related to specifically to the TRC. But again, for me, this is more like a sea wave which builds up, it crashes, builds up, it crashes, it's coming back again, but in a different form. So perhaps you might want to say more. Does that give you some clues? <laughs> Thanks. I'm gonna I'm going to read um I'm trying to think. Approach this in the order they were asked. And Amanda Traeger actually asked a question and then rephrased it. So I'm going to start from, I'll start with her question. She says, and I don't know if you guys can, well, I'll just read it out. Curious if Pat has thoughts about the promising and problematic events at Bruce's Beach in relation to reparations and the need for and challenges in work, in work less rooted in education, creation of new monuments, art, etc and more in tangible redistribution. Just to note that as an artist, I'm more involved in gestures and the symbolic order, but my work is informed by the tangible. I'm not familiar with it, so she'll have to, maybe she can speak to that. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think we're looking for examples always. Of... Yeah, yeah, so it's, maybe we're starting something here. Let's, I mean, I think, what of I'll just say this, just to maybe get us started, that part of what I, my thesis is that you, you can't um, repair or rupture the thing that you can't see or name. So if, um, so this um, Amanda is, is, is saying there's something that's already an intervention. So if we're thinking about interventions, where, where is that happening? And um, how do we, maybe we start to collect those to see, um, but it's certainly something that uh, I'll take back with me, this example. Oh, yeah. I like what you say that you can't repair something, you know, you can't name. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's partly why the language of hauntings, uh, you know, I try to skew this language because it moves us away from actually naming the deeds. You know, the acts that we, we, we see, we encounter in, in, in our societies, in yours and in ours, they are parallels, you know, and it's not a haunting, you know, there, there is part of it is the continuity, is that sense of something that won't go away, something that is repeated. But the question is, 
you know, the danger is to always then place it in the realm of the past when actually it's in the now, right? It's a contemporary, the consequences of the con contemporary. What's interesting for me in this, um, in, in these conversations is how how to uh, to 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 understand. I mean, these processes are important because they allow us to probe and to probe deeper. And here is one area that needs to be probed deeper. What is it about, for example, let us take for example, gender-based violence. We 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 know what women who were enslaved experienced. And under slave masters, the rape, the violence, you know, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, um, a, a very powerful story told by Frederick Douglass, you know, who has several experiences of being out and in, out and in of enslavement and eventually out. And then he writes these beautiful, I mean, it's hard to say beautiful, but he writes these really um, provocative and, and poignant narratives about his experiences. And among his experiences, he writes about his aunt. You know, his aunt screams as she was raped and beaten by the slave master. Now the question is, that story belongs, you know, of course, it belongs to the slave masters and that history. But when we think about what's happening today on women's bodies, I mean, the women who are slashed their stomachs and babies pop out and hung up, up on trees, women who are cut up and put in bags, you know, in black bags. And this is done and, and, and often enough, the perpetrators of these crimes are found that they are men. And so these, th that is the dramatic and the spectacular kind of violence. There's the other violence, which is much more subtle, but which sort of repeats these acts of slave masters by men who sometimes are themselves the revolutionaries who are fighting for change. And so there's something about this repetition that we need to think about. I mean, another example that comes to mind is the example of the teacher who drops a, a boy into a pit toilet because his, his phone fell in the toilet, in the pit toilet. And so he takes a boy whom he knows is brought up by a grandmother who is on pension. So for, for a very, from a very disadvantaged uh, uh, community, he gets this boy, gets other boys to tie, to hold him with a rope, gets him to strip, drops him in, in the pit toilet. Now, the sad thing about it is this, there's no re response that is effective and meaningful. And yet, if this was a, a white person doing that to a black boy, there would have been buses of the EFF and from KwaZulu Natal, from Eastern Cape, from all corners of South Africa to protest that act. This was an, an item in the news once or twice. So the question is, this repetition of the power you know, by men against women, the same power, similar power, same power that was performed by and acted by slave masters on black women's bodies is happening now. How do we under how do we how do we speak about that? So my, I, for me the question this may be too provocative. Mm. But the question is, why wouldn't that happen? Yeah. I mean, you know, we can give examples of once you're in the container, in the system, in the thing that is happening, then the system just goes. I mean, we're sitting here, we're talking, we have our microphone. I mean, it's, it, it gets to the level of the mundane. This is how systems yeah. work. Yeah. The question is, how do we rupture those systems? Well, first, name that it's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, can we, um, you know, we're living in an era when as humans, we are tolerating, as we have been historic, this violence, you know, through the patriarchy, through 
what's happening with migrants and you know we 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 have we we have the capacity to tolerate what is happening around us right now so the the, the question is what are the tools for disrupting and who are the ones to do the disrupting this goes to the second question you know this idea of, of his, historiography and and rupture and continuity it's you know these these systems keep repeating themselves because there are the tools for repetition are there and the tools for for disruption are not and you 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 called Derek Bell into the thing it's interesting i i recently pulled out my faces at the bottom of the well um, book um, to think about this, you know, so prescient, he, you know, in writing about this. And he talks about that it's not so much our capacity to endure and how, it is the capacity for this power to keep doing the same thing that they know how to do, to replicate. Well, to just, yeah, to start over, even. Um, so to the first question, this question about um, performance, uh, you know, how do we heal uh, trauma? I mean, I think performance is a way into that. I have wonderful colleagues at UNC Chapel Hill who are, uh, who think about performance as a form of, of um, uh, as an analytic, right? Um, and, and of course, tied to this, um, thinking about trauma-informed teaching and education. You know, you have to sort of think about who's doing it. You have to get the, the, the critical strands there. Um, and then I have another colleague uh, who's at uh, Colorado, Joelle Cruz, who's written about um, organizing in, in trauma, um, you know, places where war has happened in, in uh, places in, in Africa. And there, so there are people who are doing that work, sister. So you're, 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 you know, you're a doctor. Did you say you're a doctor? You're a professor? You're, yeah. And, and stay in that work and engage um, in those projects of thinking about, um, you know, I'm just thinking about these wonderful performances where women are speaking of their trauma of, um, you know, sexual abuse, for example, and gender violence. It, it's not linear. It's, you know, it's, there's a moment where you, there's a space where you do need to just heal by naming something, being just able to say something aloud. You know, I mentioned this conversation with Emily Bingham. I mean, that, that is, it's not gonna get the name off the bill. It may eventually, maybe, but that moment where, two descendants of, of these systems were speaking. That was very powerful. It was healing for me in, in some ways. Uh, you know, you reminded me of um, the, um, the, the Benjaminian angel of history. You know, he talks about this, um, this image, this artwork that, um, represents a sense in which, although there seems to be progress, you know, going forward, there is at the same time with every progress, it leaves like a, an eruption of storms, you know, behind. So as, 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 as the angel forges forward into progress, the, it's actually forging into this violent storms. And it's a way of Benjamin saying, you know, that these uh, stories, they repeat the violence. Actually, we may think that we are sorting things out and head is an explosion that may be even worse than the one before. But it's not enough for us to just say that, you know, to make that observation, but rather to really think carefully. And I think this is why I, I like Derek Bell's work a lot. I mean, it's critical race theory is fashionable now, but it's, it, it, it's sort of like, you know, I'm applying critical race theory. But, but the thing is, what he says actually is that this it, to get it that it's not going to change, you know, racism, you are not going to eradicate racism. It's 
says, get it, you're not gonna eradicate racism. And I think that's, the, that's a powerful insight that why is it that we are experiencing it now when several generations back, you know, our focus is fight. So we are not going to change racism, you know, this it will be there. The, the point he makes is that precisely because it will be there, we should double up our efforts. And so it's 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 this sense of responsibility, this sense of you know of modesty, really being modest that we we have this utopian views, you know, in our struggle for change and transformation. Let's temper that with some modesty, you know, and and that really is is the message. And the reality has shown that actually that is true. That is the situation. Okay. Yes, we I mean, we're at the, we're, we we can probably go for about another five to ten minutes at the most. And there are there are a couple of questions online. Them up and then do a, a final round from in here, and then you guys can have the yeah. So, um, okay, there's one from Mishka Lewis, who's a fellow in the center. She says, Very interesting comment, um, Prof. Pumla. I wonder whether these cases of spectacular violence and their imitations to face what was done indeed do work to make the perpetrators feel guilt, emotion, or whether it has the opposite psychological effect of attracting people to that brutal violence. Christina Sharp makes the provocation of Nazi memorabilia. She's, and she quotes, memorialization not of the wounded, but of the perpetrator. Perhaps that speaks to the unconscious where visual repetitions of violence produce something other than condemnation of the Nazis. Thank you for articulating the other side where tears may say something else. Really enjoyed both presentations and the deep thinking we are invited to as audience. From, from Helen Boone. <laughs> this is a very interesting presentation. My question is for Dr. Parker. Your statement about the commission must not be just a grandfather, but a commission for change. What was the defining moment of your acceptance of the position as co chair? And then, if I can just reach across here, there was one question in the QA that we didn't get to. Questions. Can it do, maybe yeah. yeah i'm happy to thank you mishka so much for that uh, for that point um you know you you all, all the, what you say is true but i think what we also have to understand is that all of that is true the, the, all of these responsible the, these responses are always possible that sometimes in fact you found even in one perpetrator Jeffrey Benzin being a very good example. There's one, one moment where he weeps and the tears are not, you know, he's not making it up. He's actually, he feels the sense of what did I do? You know, as a, this person is confronting me with my deeds and at the core, I am, I do have, I mean, for those people who do still have a conscience, some of them don't. But there, there is a sense, you can see the emotion, you can see his weeping, his eyes responding and he's talking back, you know, responding to the, to the person. I, you know, frankly, I asked myself the same question, what kind of a person was I? At the same time, in another testimony, he reminds a victim, one of his torture victims says, but don't you remember I bought you Kentucky Fried Chicken? Why are you, almost like saying, I was a good torturer, you know, I, I will be stopped and played kind to you. And, and forgetting that these are strategies of perpetrators, it's the, the, the appropriation, you know, of, of, of the ordinary, you know, to abuse the person. It's kind of a violent appropriation of the ordinary, you know, and in this case, a relationship of being of kindness. He's appropriating that violently because his, his goals are not to help this person. So even within a perpetrator who, who, who acts 
sometimes even remorsefully, this is not a good place to be. They want sometimes there's a sense of being driven to that memory of when they had power. So, so we have to accept that sometimes. But the danger is with these people who are denying that it happened. You know, the deniers are actually the problem. The, the, because of psychological reasons, they, they struggle to really get to that point. Remember that these acts were terrible. These were unspeakable acts. So what you're asking is, look, look. And when they look, they go into the abyss and they see the bodies. You know, they see the death, the deaths that they caused. And that cannot be easy for anyone. And so there, there are those moments. But the, I think the greatest difficulty is those who are incomplete. They don't want to even see. And this is why the work of your, your country, uh, artists, artists from your country, um, uh, uh, Gonzalez Day, he did a, a really powerful art exhibition called Erased Lynchings. And what they are famous photographs or infamous photographs that you find on the internet of lynchings in the United States. We, we know images, you, 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 you type on Google lynching, you see these images of black men being hung on the trees and white people, large numbers of white people, beautifully dressed children, children. and children and children, beautiful dress. And what Gonzalez Day does with this exhibition, he goes to these sites and in the image, he removes the hanging bodies. So you are left with these people who are looking with smiles on their faces, they're beautifully dressed. And so the point is, this is who it is who did this. Mm -hmm. So don't cast your gaze on the doer of the deed. Not because, again, as Mishka says, there is the lure of, you know, you've seen so much violence and sometimes actually it invites you. But now with this kind of exhibition, he says, look at the doer of the deed and then, you know, reflect on it. And, and because the who are these people? Who are they? Who are their children? Where are their children? What have they taught them? And, and, and so that is an important part of this work, of this kind of work. I, I think it's showing there are multiple points of intervention, the arts and the humanities and the, you know, the social sciences. Um, but we have to know what the project is, right? And I think it's about truth telling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, I, I've been thinking about this, this idea of discernment, mm -hmm. um, you know? Um, so having that capacity to see, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, there's a quote from Malcolm X where he talks about, I'm gonna paraphrase, um, you know, if you have a knife in your back, oh, oh. coming back, it's it's coming back. back. Oh. it means it means the knife is coming back. Oh, oh. Well, I did a general. It's yeah. 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 Okay, it's a Okay. Wow. Did we lose the other? No, they will come back. They will come back. Yeah, there was some. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Shall I continue? All right. So, Malcolm. Yeah. It's in the room. It's. Yeah, this quote that if it's ancestors. That's right. Yes. The ancestors are waiting to see what we do. They are. Um, you have a knife in your back, pulling it out 12 inches. Uh, if, you know, if it's a 12 inch knife and pulling it out four or five inches is not going to heal the wound. It's not going to, you know, change the trauma. Um, and so I think this idea of discernment is just, you know, we want the knife all the way out. And if we're talking about repair, you know, you're not repairing something around the knife to use the, these metaphors. We've got the weight, we've got, you know, others we can use. So. I think um, this is what we're, and so this artist intervention to me shows this powerful understanding of what the project is, you know, to say, 
you know, we've been living with these images. And what, what does the image do in this project? And so he's flipping that and, and yeah. telling a, 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 another story. Um, and to my sister who asked the question online about what was the defining moment for me to uh, accept the chancellor's invitation, I, I don't know if there was a defining moment except that um, it was sort of, it was a leap of faith though. There, there was, um, there's actually a moment that's on um, video where there's a faculty council meeting protesting the, the what we have had learned of um, this backroom deal with a neo-Confederate group to that the university would give three million dollars to them to take you saw the statue that was fallen to take the statue and to put enshrine it. And so this was sort of, and so we were having a big meeting about that and the chancellor was there and he actually mentioned the formation of this commission before I had given him permission to do so. And um, I, so I spoke at that, um, at, at that meeting and that was probably the defining moment when I was able to say to the chancellor that I'm going to be on this commission at a time when these kinds of ruptures or, or you know, just this egregiousness is happening. Um, and I'm holding you accountable that this work is going to be an intervention into this. Anyway, it's on tape. I'm not sure what exactly my words were, <laughs> but it was very, um, um, that was a, a defining moment that, you know, if, if sometimes you feel like you're called Absolutely. in a moment yeah. Yeah. to do. So, yeah. Oh, we didn't get to the last question. So we can we can continue the the, the conversation um, once the camera is off <laughs> by our own choice and not ESCOMs. Um, we are still online and they can still hear us with our our uh, videos frozen. It's frozen. Oh. So I was going to say thank you so much to Paul. Thank you. Thank you. You're frozen again. Thank you. So, so just to say that this has been um, the first in a series. Um, I don't know if Kathy's still on, if, if you want to announce the next one. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm just, I've got my jacket on. I've got to unfortunately run. Um, in terms of in terms of the um, Critical Humanities Spaces Network, this is the first in a series, as Moritz just said. Our, our next one will take place on June 22nd um, at the CHCI annual meeting, which is taking place in Santiago. Um, but we will have, it'll be hybrid. So there will be um, a Zoom sign up for anybody who wants to join. And the next one is going to be called Repair, Temporalities and Spaces of Undoing. And we'll focus wow. more specifically on, um, on the spaces we create in our centers and, and institutes and so on. Um, for this work of repair and, and to discuss questions such as this. So I hope that um, you all can join us for part two and there may be a part three uh, in July, but we will announce that later. We're working on it right now. Um, and again, please sign up for our mailing list. I put the link um, to our, our page on the CHCI website um, uh, in the chat. Uh, we're working on on getting an own uh, website of our own eventually, but for now, um, that's where to find our information and our mailing list. So thank you so much, both of you, uh, for your tremendous, thank you. tremendous thank you. Thank talk. You. Really thank you. wonderful. Much to thank think about. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to go, um, but I hope All right. can, I hope you can continue the conversation for a little bit. Bye bye. Uh, can we save the questions in the chat also? Yeah, um, Aaron. And send us. Aaron. Will you be saving the questions that are in the yeah. in the chat and in the um in the Q and A? Yeah. Did you say you want me to save them or you want me to say them? Save them. Save them. Save them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'll I'll save the text file. Yes. <laughs>
Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.